So we decided to come to family camp because we'd been two times before and we loved it. We'd only been for one day previously though. And this year they offered a two day like overnight option and we were really excited to try that for the first time. I think attending family camp this year uh, impacted our family uh, because we got the chance to do breakouts and talk about the, the fruits of the spirit and how those apply to our lives and um, the fruit that you know the Holy Spirit puts in us. They're not natural, they, they come from Him and uh, it, it was interesting to get into those topics with the kids and talk about them on a deeper level than we normally get to day to day here in the hustle, bu hustle and bustle of everyday life. Yeah, I think the biggest impact for me was similar. We had a breakout where we were really supposed to not only talk about fruits of the spirit, but also practice a spiritual discipline together. And in that we were sort of confessing which fruit we feel like the spirit needs to maybe build up in us the most. And I think to pray for everyone, for the kids to hear us saying like, we need to work on this and to hear them like honestly say what they needed to work on too. Um, and then pray for one another was really meaningful to me. A highlight this year for me was, I can really tell our kids are getting older and a little bit more mature. Uh, so the discussions did feel deeper this year than in years past, and that just comes with age. But the, the questions were um, really good, uh, open-ended, letting the kids kind of share um, more and more, and they're talking more and more on a, on a spiritual level. And so that's really neat to, to hear. Um, I think highlights just activity. We, we had a blast playing. Uh, with the boys canoeing and archery tag with a ton of fun too. Yeah, I think, I mean, the biggest highlight was Jackson getting baptized. That was really special. Uh, I remember my dad baptizing me when I was uh, younger and that was incredibly special. And, uh, you know, we, we take these steps in faith of, of obedience. And so throughout Jackson's life, seeing him talk about faith and wrestle with faith and uh, come to faith in Jesus was in incredibly exciting and so being able to be part of that and actually get to baptize them at family camp was just a highlight for sure. A cool thing about being baptized at family camp was that instead of having the grown-ups in one place and the kids in another was that they were like all together instead of separate so that was cool. I will say one of my favorite things about family camp, having been there several times and going again, is that as a church body, family camp is an opportunity where we get to see for just two days, but you're like truly living life with other families in different ages. So like this year, our boys got in a fight on the smash ball court, which is totally normal and everyone sees it and it's, fine like we're all just there we see other people and their kids and you know babies are crying during worship services and I kind of love that that when we're together um, you just not only are knowing each other on a deeper level but you're seeing like all of our families have flaws we're all normal and we're all just trying to like pursue Christ together parents need encouragement and they need people to talk to and I think that at family camp, it's just natural to sit by another family at lunch and talk and get to know each other and then see each other out during activities and sitting by the pool were some really great conversations I had with other, other parents while our kids were swimming. Um, so just more of more conversations, more just uh, breaking that barrier of, oh, I see you every Sunday, but let's, let's get to know each other on a, on a deeper level. Well, good morning, fellowship. Good morning. Welcome in on a rainy weekend. Uh, this, this week, you probably noticed we have a little bit lighter crew up here on stage. Um, and every week that we worship, we're all on the worship team together. We're all bringing our worship together and encouraging one another and lifting our praises. But maybe on a week like this, it's a little bit more noticeable because we can hear each other. So I just invite you to engage and sing. And if there's moments where you're singing and you're struck by what you're hearing, it's okay to stop and just listen and give praise for what you're listening to. But would you stand with us? I'm gonna pray for our time together.
Father, we come before you and we adore you. We focus our attention on you right now. We take a breath from the week that we've had. Would you pull us into your presence, Lord? Because you're always moving. You're always consistent. So we just want to line up with you in your heart. In your son's name we pray. Good morning, Fellowship Bentonville. You may be seated. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. If you are new here, or maybe it's your first time visiting, feel free to text hashtag new to the number on the screen, or stop by the community booth um, after the service. We'd love to connect with you. My name is Caroline Rhodes, and this is Danny Sullivan. We both serve on the elementary team here, and most Sundays you'll find us on the west end of campus hanging out with kindergarten through sixth graders, and we love our time with them. And I like to tell people that the students we work with, they're not the church of tomorrow, they are the church of today. So just like you, they're experiencing cell and celebration through small group, through large group, and they're learning about Jesus and how to follow him just like you guys are. And we love the hour or so that we get to spend with our students on Sundays, but our hope is that the parents of the kids we work with will be the spiritual champions in their lives. And it's our family ministry mission statement to help families own the spiritual development of the next generation. We do that multiple ways, but one of the major ways is through family camp every year. It's kind of like our Super Bowl, and it's coming up this May. We'd love to share with you a little bit about that. Yeah, it's our hope every year uh, for family camp to create an environment where families can connect with God and connect with each other, and connect with other families on a deep level. And like the Lloyds shared in the video at the beginning of the service, one of the highlights of family camp is getting to worship together as a whole family, um, and then breaking out and having an intentional time of spiritual conversations that our team works on. Um, and we, we put the ball on the tee for parents to hit a, a home run with the whole family. Um, and then another highlight is um, 
just the fact that the whole, the whole weekend, we work really hard to create an unheard environment, um, which is really the, the type of environment where you can connect deeply with your family and other families and unplug. And, and so that unheard environment is what we try to create. Um, with that being said, there's so much to do out at New Life Ranch and at family camp. There's a beautiful creek that runs through camp that you can kayak, canoe, and fish in. Um, there's basketball and wiffle ball and all sorts of games out at camp, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's just a, a great time. Um, and so this year, we have two options for your family. You can come out on Saturday just for the day, 9 to 9, or you can sign up um, to stay out there two nights this year. That's right. We will be at New Life Ranch, Flint Valley, which is in Colkert, Oklahoma. So the day option is May 25th, Memorial Day weekend, and the two-night option is May 25th through the 27th. And while family camp is really designed for parents or families with at least one child of elementary age, really everybody's welcome. We would love to see families come out as community groups or even bring their grandparents. And registration is available online. We hope you'll join us. Caroline, uh, would you guys stand with us? Uh, as they were talking, I was just reminded that uh, me and my wife, Johanna, we've got three little girls, seven, six, and three. Um, and as we lead into this next song called Abide, I think a lot about the weight of parenting sometimes feels overwhelming. It feels like, oh my gosh, I'm in charge of these humans and what are we supposed to do? How do I know? And, and I, I think the words of these songs coming back to just abiding in Jesus. We can't lead a family. We can't lead friends. We can't lead a community group in our workplace. Wherever we are, we can't lead where we haven't been ourselves. And the strength of that with Christ is that we can abide in him. The source of life found in him. And as Mark will talk about, he is faithful. He is steadfast. And he provides more than enough. We're talking about the miracle feeding of the 5,000 today. So would you enter in and, and abide for yourself this morning in him?
Fellowship. Good morning, and I'd like to invite our family and friends up here to celebrate uh, Bo's baptism. So if they want to come up here while I say a few words, that would be great. So hey, everyone, we are excited to celebrate a really special moment, Bo's baptism. Now, Bo is not just any kid. He's someone who really shows us every day what it means to have a big heart. His empathy, his kindness, and his unwavering loyalty are just some of the qualities that make him stand out. He's deeply thoughtful, wise beyond his years, and has this incredible ability to love and care about everything and everyone around him. Bo is an an amazing reflection of Jesus' teaching here on earth. His conviction is something to behold when he sets his mind on supporting someone he's all in and no holding back. In his prayers, every single night, Bo prays. Sometimes he prays for things that we don't even see. And one thing I want to I want to share with everyone here today is that my wife and I had the chance to go and spend time with him in Scottsdale, Arizona, and hike Camelback. And there was one time that we just got to the top of it, and we just reflected on you know, the moment that we had at the top of Camelback. And he was the one that prompted us to just be and in, feel inspiration from that moment, and actually asked us to pray at that very moment. So you know that he is someone that is convicted in what he believes. And that's Bo for you, always clear about his path and eager to live his faith. So I want to reflect on the words that we sang a couple weeks ago. Um, By death was arrested. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the, the redeemed when death was arrested and my life began. So with that said, Bo, it is my honor to welcome you to your new life with your brothers and sisters in this room today. Is it your testimony that you will follow Christ for eternity and bring his message to others? Yes. Okay. It is my joy. Put your feet on there. All right. It is my joy as your brother of Christ to baptize you, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the readiness of life. <laughs> Newness of life. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Would you all stand with us? Praise God for just the fact that he draws near to us and he wants us to be in relationship with him. And so in that same spirit of celebration and confession that we need the Lord, we're going to sing these familiar words out. So let's sing this together.
Jesus from Mark 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come, get away with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we going to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. The word of the Lord. You know, in some faith traditions, when God's word is read publicly uh, to us as God's people, and we will say, this is the word of the Lord. There are so many faith traditions that will respond, thanks be to God. Why do we say that? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Why do we say that? I wonder. I think it's because hopefully our mamas taught us to say thank you when someone serves a meal to you. 
And God's word is a meal in front of us. And so we just say, thank you for feeding me again today. Uh, we uh, all have experiences in life that you can recall exactly where you were when it happened. Some events are so unique, they're so prominent and dominant uh, that you just know exactly even where you were. Uh, for those of us who are at least old enough, if I say 9-11, you know exactly where you were when you heard about the planes hitting the towers. I wonder what that had been like for Jesus' disciples, though. Do they have any event that was so dominant and so unique that all of them would agree, I know exactly where I was when that happened. Interestingly enough, the New Testament has only two miracles of Jesus that all four of the gospel writers choose to record. Obviously, one of them is the resurrection of Jesus. It would not be a gospel if he was not still alive. But then there's only one other one, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. Something must have been so unique and so dominant uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is told uh, through a, a point of view. Um, by the way, right now on social media, the acronym that is most popular is POV or hashtag POV. And it tells you that the content you're going to be looking at or reading comes from the author's point of view. And you can read the feeding of the 5,000 and begin to think or begin to see that it's told through several points of view, that different gospel writers give us different lens on the same uh, miracle. And so you wonder what the point of view would have been from the little boy who gave up his lunch. And you wonder what the point of view might be even through Jesus who was doing the miracle. Wouldn't that be fascinating to know? By the way, that's the Gospel of John's account. But the Gospel of Mark that we're studying in this series gives us a unique hashtag POV. And it's from the disciples. And when you look at that miracle from and through the disciples' view of vision, all of a sudden it takes on a whole new meaning of what it means for us to be disciples and to follow Jesus Christ. Now, here's the candid truth. Uh, knowing that this uh, miracle was on my assignment uh, for this part of the series, there was part of me two weeks ago when I began to approach the passage that thought, I really don't know how many times I've read the miracle. I don't know. Let's say more than 100. I know that I preached it dozens of times. But in the last two weeks, I've had this amazing sense of, how have I never seen this? This is so fresh. God's word is like a fresh meal. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and so let's jump into this miracle together and begin to see what we have. We need to know that this miracle comes on the heels of some events in the disciples' lives. Remember, POV, from the, and through the disciples' lens. It also comes through the, some events that happened in Jesus' life. The disciples had just been sent out, two by two, to do their first solo ministry trip without Jesus present. Nervous. Mission trip launched, student leader not coming. And they've been told to go out and preach the gospel <laughs> and cast out demons. And they're probably thinking, I haven't done either of those before. And they come back, and they say, Lord, and this is my translation, it worked. <laughs> the demons were cast out in your name. And you can almost picture the giddy excitement that they have. But in the meantime, I don't think Jesus' heart is filled with giddy excitement. Because while they were going on their mission trip, something happens in his life that fills him with grief. His cousin John is murdered by Herod's executioner. So their giddy excitement, his grief and loss, and then we pick up the story in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place, and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Notice that Jesus slips away with his men after this flurry of activity and expectation, after this pressure and push of people and their demands, and after his own heart that's heavy with grief, Jesus knows that he needed a break, and he looked at these men who he loved, and he said, you need a break, and he said, the next most spiritual thing we can do is take a retreat and get some rest. And so he calls a, a community group retreat. 
and he wants to do it by a lake. And that's why our community groups often find lake houses and retreat as well. It's got a good pattern to it, doesn't it? Some of you are now thinking, huh, my group should do that. Indeed, you should. And he says, let's go by ourselves. And he has one real goal. And he puts the agenda to the re of the retreat on the table and gets some rest. You know, after you are engaged in a heavy season of God-given assignments, sometimes the next most godly thing you can do is get some rest. Pull away with Jesus and take a retreat. Verse, the next verse tells us what happened and how the retreat went. By the way, this is exactly why about 180 men pulled away this weekend in a men's retreat. Even in the rain, they showed up. There was a sense of we need to get away and get some rest. This is why family camps happen. We need to get away and get some rest. Well, their agenda didn't work so well. Verse 33, but many who saw, notice it doesn't say just him, them, remember the disciples were already out doing some miracles on their own, uh, saw them leaving, recognized them, and ran on foot all from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. How large is the crowd? Uh, we had it read to us. We know that verse 44 tells us is 5,000 men. I don't know how large the crowd is. Uh, I know they didn't count the women and the children, so can you just kind of make it up with me? I think it's logical that we'd say with women and children, 15,000? 20,000? Would we say that's probably a reasonable estimate? Uh, I don't know the last time you went on a, a community group retreat and 20,000 tried to bunk with you. It disrupts your rest. And getting away by yourself has now been thrown to the wind. How do you handle it when interruptions happen to your best laid plans? Isn't that interesting? I know how I handle it. Frustration bubbles up. I mean, maybe you're the couple who has known that you have needed a little a marriage getaway for just the two of you. You've been looking forward to it. You've planned it. You've done all the work at getting child care handled. And the morning that you start to pack up and slip away, one child wakes up throwing up on you and the other one with 103 fever. You know it's not fair to be angry at the child who can't help it, so you yell at your spouse. And you do that because you're angry. Your interruption, your interrupted expectations bubble up and they create this cocktail of negative emotions in us. In the wisdom of Jan and Tom Stockdale, they created a class that has ministered to a bunch of us. The class is entitled Interrupted Expectations. And it's a class that actually, really, it's, to call it a class is not really fair, is it, Jan? It's more of an experience that a group does together to understand that there are losses that come in all different kinds of packages, and those losses interrupt the expectations we have of life, and we need help sorting out those emotions. Interruptions, we think, they just get in the way of life. And then a wisdom comes sometimes from a sage that we need to hear. And C.S. Lewis says this about interruptions. He says, the great thing, by the way, he doesn't say a really kind of nice thing. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruption of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. The life God is sending one day by day. Now, Jesus knew this, and he handled this horde of needy people so differently. You remember, you got a crowd, 15 to 20,000, and none of them are showing up to Jesus and saying, I just want to check on you. How are you? You've gone through some loss lately. No, they're bringing them their truckload of need, and they're saying, fix me, take care of me, relieve my pain. Before we look at the next verse, let's remember one clear thing that we saw in the first week of Mark when we opened up the series and we realized Jesus was going around preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And we said, what is the gospel? What does it mean to live gospel-centered? So if your work was gospel-centered, if your home was gospel-centered, if your play, uh, if your church community, if your larger life in the community in Bentonville was gospel-centered, what does that mean? And we said, well, the gospel really in the most simple definition that I have come up with is this, the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done 
still does and continues to do in our life. We know that we said that the the gospel of Mark is just going to be a story where we're going to see, oh, this is who Jesus is. Oh, this is what he does. And we'll see that come to us page by page. Well, as we turn these next verses, we're going to say, oh, this is who Jesus is. Oh, this is what he does. And so let's look. Because Jesus, he wants to meet the needs of needy people. And by needy people, I don't just mean the fifteen or 20,000 who came to them with their need. I mean people like you and me, disciples. This is the next line. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. This is who Jesus is. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This is who Jesus is. He feels, feels compassion when he sees our need. Maybe you have heard somewhere, read somewhere, that the Greek word for compassion literally means bowels or gut. Actually, technically, it means spleen. That's not much more attractive. But it's a Greek word that said, when something happens to you, I feel your pain so much that I go, "Mm," in here. And ours is a savior. When he sees our need, he doesn't say, "Ah, again, I feel like I'm just always having to help you clean up your stuff, take care of your need. No. He feels our need. And it moves him into action on our behalf. Because Roman numeral one on a a Savior's job description is to save. To see our need on the deepest levels and to move with compassion to meet those needs. This is who our Savior is. And notice he said, I feel their need. And he looked at them and said, what is their need? They are like, do you see it in the text? Say it with me. Sheep without a shepherd. Which is interesting because that's not what those people would have said. They would say, I'm demon possessed. My son is lame. I have a disabled daughter. I've had a workplace accident and I can no longer work and I need healing. I have leprosy and I've been ostracized from the community. I've got some presenting needs here that must be addressed, Jesus. And he's so good. He says, I see that and it breaks my heart. But I see your real need below that. And you are like a sheep without a shepherd. And a sheep without a shepherd is in a whole worse way than even their circumstances. See, a sheep without a shepherd means that you're lost and you're aimless. Where your Tuesday looks like your Monday and your Wednesday looks like your your Tuesday and so on and so on until you rack up years and you rack up decades and you rack up a life and you just say, I just don't even know what this is about anymore. Or you feel this sense of I just got to make it up on my own and wander through life and I have no real direction and I certainly don't have a guide to walk me through life. Shepherdless sheep, well, quite honestly, a shepherdless sheep is somebody you would call prey. You've never met an old shepherdless sheep in the pasture. They've already been devoured by predators. Shepherdless sheep are hungry and malnourished because they're so misguided they'll keep feeding on the same patch of grass until they work it down all the way to the nub. See, shepherdless sheep are always eating and never fully satisfied. And Jesus saw that, even through their presenting needs, and it did not repel him. It drew him to them, and he moves into action. And when Jesus sees shepherdless sheep, the next line tells you what he did. The next line could have said, and he relieved all of their painful circumstances, because ours is a Savior who could do that. But instead, it says, so he began to teach them many things. And in the Gospel of Luke, it actually says, so he began to teach them many things about the kingdom of God. Knowing that what we need most is the king to rule over the kingdom of our lives. I need a leader and a Lord who will take me in the ways of God. 
And he said he began to teach them many things. And I think what we really need to say is in your notes of your Bible, you could write, and he served the first meal. And the first meal was his word. And the people stayed all day for hours listening to the word of God, which tells me that hungry people must have known where the buffet was, and they stayed at the all-you-can-eat buffet. And maybe we can learn something from that. That sometimes the inside hunger we feel, we think it's our circumstances, but they're really hunger pains. We have a desperate need for God's Word, to continually feed on God's Word and see His Word nourish our, our minds, our hearts, our souls, and our lives. Jesus is so good, He moved into action. He knows that without the Word of God, we are undernourished. We're always eating, and we're never fully satisfied. And then verse 35, the disciples enter the story with some proactive in their part, they think spiritual leadership. It says, by this time, it was late in the day, and so his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, they said, already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy something themselves to eat. Whew, that's a too often how I approach daily problems. I come to God, and I tell him, send away my problem. So that I can live life out of my own resources. I can buy something by myself and I can make it through another day because I want to make life work like you want to make life work. And Jesus says in verse 37, because he's that good of a shepherd, he responds, you give them something to eat. They said to him, Jesus, whew, that would take our entire Dave Ramsey six-month emergency fund. And we still wouldn't have enough, and the people would still be hungry. Don't you notice you see two commands here? By the way, uh, the Greek language uh, has command forms of the verb, uh, and we see two of them. In verse uh, 36, we see G uh, the disciples commanding Jesus to do something. Because these are bossy sheep. Send them away. By the way, do not judge them. We're a room full of really bossy sheep. We just happen to call it prayer requests. God, your job is to take care of this. Move this. This is in my obstacle. I need you to get it out of my way. I need, and, and then I want to take care of this myself. And Jesus answers their command to him with a command to them. You feed them. Oh, my. Do you notice that this is a very clear, direct command from the master of the universe? You feed them. And he gives them an impossible assignment. Now, the disciples have seen Jesus do some amazing things. They've seen him at this point. We've seen heal a paralytic, uh, heal a woman from her chronic illness, raise a little girl from the dead. They've been part of some of those miracles and has he commissioned them to go and cast out demons. But this assignment flat out in their land, through their own words, their own POV, you have asked us too much, Jesus. You've gone too far. Jesus, this won't work. And you've been there. Because we face impossible assignments all the time. Because he's that good to us, we face impossible assignments all the time. You get a health report. I just, Lord, I can't go there. This is too scary. A business you've started and been carrying for decades, it's gone below water. Lord, this is too much. It's oppressive. A child you love more than life itself, and she rebels in a way that just breaks your heart, and the choices are just devastating, not just to their life, but painful for yours. And you go, Lord, it's impossible. I don't even know how to parent this child. I, I am, you're asking me, to do an impossible assignment, a loss that you're walking with. Lord, I am being drowned in grief right now. I won't be able to make it. Jesus commands us 
to do impossible assignments from time to time. And men and women, those are not accidents. Impossible situations are not accidents. They're actually God-given assignments. He actually has a plan for the situation, but because he's so good, he has an agenda for the disciple at the same time. Look at verse 38. He says, tell us pause here a little bit, men. Tell me what you do have, he says in verse 38. He says, go and see. And when they found out, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Now, I want to believe the best of these disciples who are my heroes, my spiritual heroes. And I want to believe they found a little boy who willingly said, the master could have my lunch. But it could be that Judas stole it. Judas being Jews, just like, give me that. Regardless, we have an unnamed hero in the story. And he's a little boy who had a day's portion, a meal's portion of lunch. <laughs> and the little goes a really long way in Jesus' hands. Just the most powerful vision of generosity I know. Whether it's our time and our treasure, our talents, our relationships, uh, this vision of, I can put what I have in the master's hands and he could feed thousands. By the way, thousands, I don't mean just 20,000. That was his immediate feeding. But this morning, we're eating on this story as well because of the generosity of an unnamed little hero. The story continues in verse 39. Verse 39, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now Jesus gives a second command to the disciples. Now remember, the first command caused them to be pretty confused. You feed them. What? Can't be done. Impossible assignment. The second command, have the people sit down. By the way, literally the word means recline, lay down. Mark gives us a detail on the green grass. I think that created panic in the disciples because now they're saying to themselves, you've launched a picnic, but the caterer hasn't shown. And now you're asking us to be the spearhead of the promo and organizing committee. And so this, we just raised expectation and we have no way to see it happen. By the way, don't miss the intentional words that the Holy Spirit chooses to put in this text. Commanded them, have the people recline on the green grass. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Do you see who Jesus is? Good news is going to get better because now we're going to see what he can do. The shepherd's about to serve the second meal of the day. Verse 41. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and then looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. Pause what we should do all the time with whatever resources we have. Whether we think they're abundant or little, we take them, we look to heaven, and we give thanks for what God has provided, trusting he will take care of the next move. And then Jesus broke the loaves, and he gave them to his disciples. Oh, who received the first command? You feed them, Jesus said. Who's obeying that command now? The disciples are feeding them. And he also divided the two fish among them all. The disciples, they weren't just commanded to do the impossible. They were now equipped to do what God commands. Men and women, Jesus also will send us into some impossible situations, ones we would not prescribe for ourselves, but he has decided that in his goodness and his wisdom and in his sovereignty. But he will not send us empty-handed. He will equip us to obey what he has commanded. It's incredible. I mean, think about it. This crowd, again, to put a visual picture in your mind, think about a packed Bud Walton Arena Razorback game. Holds around 20,000, a little bit over if you do the standing room. How long would it take you to one basket at a time go and feed 20,000 people up and down those hills? What we are seeing in the text is the world's longest miracle. And Jesus could have done it in an instant. He could have pulled it a Voldemort and said, meal appear. And they would have had a meal in their lap. I mean, he's powerful enough to, 
But he didn't. He did it one breaking of bread at a time, filling one basket at a time. Even as they sat there with their empty basket in front of him, he's breaking, filling, breaking, filling, breaking, filling. Just can't believe what they're staring at. They run with their first full basket to the first group of 50. They distribute it. They run back, and he's still breaking and filling, breaking and filling, breaking and filling, back and forth. I don't know, 37, 38, 52 times, back and forth up those hills. Each of them did. And the whole time, their trust in Jesus is growing. See, they started by going out to break the people up in 50s and 100s, and you have to know their voice was timid. It probably cracked, even though they were well past puberty. They probably said, sit down, <laughs> sit, sit down, sit down, sit down, everybody in groups of 50, thinking, what are we doing? And now they're back, basket after basket, and they're saying to themselves, anybody want more? No, we're stuffed. No, seriously, do you want more? We've got plenty. Do you want more? It's like my grandmother when we had grand uh, reunion meals. You're like, I can't eat anymore. Come on, you need, oh, you have room for pie? This confidence, this joy. And they come back. Everybody says, no more. And they collect the leftovers. Ah. Jesus knows what he's doing. Twelve disciples go out empty-handed. Twelve disciples left after the impossible assignment with one full Basket each. Message received. God will empower me to step into the impossible assignments he gives us. And God won't forget to feed me in the middle. I actually think this is the best vision of ministry I've ever seen. One hungry man helping another hungry man or woman find the source of bread. And just keep showing up back and forth. You know, the only thing that would have ruined the process is if after the sixth or seventh trip, the disciples looked at the empty basket and said, surely there can't be any more. If they quit coming back to him, they would no longer see his ministry power moving through them. But each time they come back, more than enough. Men and women, God will command us to obey him in some things that seem impossible. Please, I know that we sometimes say God won't give you anything that's too impossible to do or to bear. I just can't read the Bible or look at the lives of 2,000 years of saints and believe that's true. Because when I open the scriptures, I see God giving some incredibly impossible situations and commands. But what I do know is that he is compassionate enough shepherd to feed us while we step into that command and obey him. We just have to simply say, I know I don't have what it takes. But he does. And my job is just to keep faithfully coming back to him. One basket at a time, keep coming. In verse 42 through 44, the text tells us, they all ate and were satisfied. The disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls, and the number of the men who had eaten were 5,000. He equips us in the daily ways to obey his command. We are sheep with a shepherd, he will command us to impossible things. He is the shepherd who says, love your enemies. Pray, pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who do evil to you. Forgive those who've wounded you. Give generously, generously, not just out of your abundance, but even out of your need. Be holy as I am holy. Go into all the world and make disciples of every tongue, tribe, and nation, even the ones that are war-torn and terrorist-filled and hostile. Impossible commands until we realize he's the one who gives the resources to do it. This is how good our shepherd is. This is who he is and what he does. This uh, month, a uh, handful of years ago, uh, Lisa and I definitely got the sense that we were stepping into a new um, life and honestly ministry assignment, something that we really believed was a sacred stewardship from God, and it was not one that we wanted, and it was sad for everybody involved. It was the caregiving 
of two sets of elderly parents, and we're the only children that they have that live local. But honestly, we didn't resent it. We just were rookies in it. We didn't really know all that that would mean. The intensity of that rose, particularly with her father's health. In the middle of that, through a routine um, medical thing you got to do post-50, Lisa found out she had a cancerous tumor in her colon. And so surgery came, and it was successful, and removed that tumor, and they were able to do a resection. And just as she was physically healing and strong enough, her dad began to go downhill and was in and out of ICU several times. When it was one of the longest bouts where she would find herself up all night or all day long in the ICU, she'd been pushing me, Mark, you have been delaying your routine tests, and I need to ask you please to do it. And reluctantly, I said, yes, ma'am. And and a spot was discovered on my lungs. Now, the cancer that I had had 10 years before, they had always said the next thing we need to watch is if it comes back again, it will likely come back in your lungs. And so it required CT and PET scan, and it took about 10 days to get the results of those. I remember on the day we had to, uh, to go to the oncologist to get the results, uh, Lisa's dad looked like he was in his final hours, and I pulled up to the front of Mercy Hospital, and she came down from the ICU after not sleeping, jumped in the truck, and we ran across the freeway to the oncologist. We were about, I don't know, five or ten minutes early, and I could see the fatigue on this strong woman. And we've been to those appointments before. We've had some really good news and some news not so good. Uh, so we knew the, the weight of what that feels like in the parking lot and going through the glass doors. And I could feel it on her. So I grabbed her hand and said, hey, babe, before we go in, let's pray. And she just started to cry. And I said, tell you what. Uh, let's sing our prayer. And through kind of drippy noses, cracked voices, uh, we sang, Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, or in our language, basket by basket, new mercy I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And then we sang our favorite verse. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today. Bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings to all mine and 10,000 beside. And I don't know, when we finished that verse, we looked at each other, and we both just kind of went, amen. Let's go through the glass doors. Now, here, the punchline, so it doesn't, the test came out really well and all that we had hoped for and all that we had prayed for. But the truth is, we felt buoyed up even before we got that news 20 or 30 minutes later. We have a shepherd who does send us into some impossible assignments, at least from our point of view. But he says, I have compassion for you. And in your need, I don't push away from the table. I lean in. In fact, I pull you close to the table. And all I'm asking you to do is to keep coming back. And I'll fill you day by day with what you need. And so let's pray the shepherd's prayer. Psalm 23. And I'm not going to pray it over us. As the worship team just quietly plays, would you pray it? Some of you may even want to pray it out loud or in a whisper. Others to yourself. You have a shepherd who knows your need. He says, keep coming back.
Father, thank you that the testimony of your faithfulness through all generations is more than enough. You've covered our past, meet us in our present, you're more than enough for our future. Man, this is your first morning here. Welcome. We'd love to journey with you in this, uh, in the impossibles of life where Jesus meets us and provides more than enough and faithful. So would you, if this is your first time, meet at the Connections booth in the back. We'd love to talk. And if there's any reason we could pray for life, for renewal, for a hardship, for healing, we've got a prayer team that meets up here in the front. So please come up and receive prayer. So go in the steadfastness of the Lord this week, trusting in Him. See you next week.